There is a YouTube video out there uh, produced by Lutheran Satire, and we don't want to hold that against them, but it's actually quite funny. It's a little irreverent and a bit, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a bit risque, but, you know, it's still quite funny because it's these two guys trying to have a conversation with St. Patrick about the Holy Trinity. And they begin the conversation by saying, all right, Patrick, we're kind of simple, young folk, don't really know this whole fancy theology thing. So tell us about the Holy Trinity. And every time that Patrick uses one of the metaphors for which he's famous or which we know of the Holy Trinity, sort of ice, water, and vapor, these two folks then come out with a heresy that Patrick has just created or somehow and have participated in unknowingly, to which then Patrick sort of in this gruff sort of says finally, what the Father is, the Son is, and the Holy Spirit is. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is boundless, the Son is boundless, the Holy Spirit is boundless, the Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. Yet, nonetheless, these are three, not three eternal beings, but one eternal being, and so on and so forth, to the point which then he says, this is the Holy Catholic faith, everyone must believe it firmly, set fast, otherwise they cannot be saved. We're in trouble. I mean, but there's something quite brilliant about sort of this little satire, just showing just how complicated and beautiful this divine relationship really is. It's something that we constantly are trying to get our minds around, but the, the reality is we are trying to say that something both is and is not at the exact same time. Right? We're trying to say that there are three distinct persons and yet one divine person, right? It's three distinct entities and one divine person. If I misspeak, I've been told I can have one heresy in any homily, and it's okay. So I probably will do that at least once. So let's break them down and sort of go through who each of these folks are, and hopefully that can give us a better sense of this divine relationship. Last week we celebrated the Feast of Pentecost. And I love the Feast of Pentecost because the Holy Spirit sort of comes and gives power. And any time that the Spirit does something, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, it's always about giving gifts, right? One of my favorite is sort of, uh, you know, like Samson and Delilah and that story where Samson suddenly gets the strength of many people and they're, he's able to do these great deeds. And, and it's always that the Spirit of the Lord, or, or in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is actually like ruah. And ruah is exactly what it sounds like. It's sort of, it's a, it's a device in which the word is what it is in the sense that the, that breath, ruha, is the breath of God. That sort of mysterious being sent into Samson and he's able to sort of do these great things. And that same sort of, you know, idea of the Spirit conferring power or a mission or something like that happens in the New Testament, right? You know, even in the baptism of Jesus, we see that beautiful moment in which the Greek word schizoia, torn apart, ripped apart violently, because God is so excited at what Jesus is doing that he sends the Holy Spirit and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That sort of, that intimate moment in which we see the three persons of the divine God all right there, God speaking, spirit descending, and Jesus receiving. So the spirit is sort of that which gives us power, but then who is God? And, and I used to do this with a lot of my students when I was teaching high school and middle school. I'd always say, imagine God, what do you see? And I'd get all kinds of different things, but most frequently it was sort of an old white man with a beard. And I'm happy to say, actually, that is nothing of what God is. God is not sort of reducible to a single entity or idea of what we can do with God. God is beyond gender and form. We get that because a lot of artists will depict God in that way because of the phrase ancient of days, right? This sort of elderly figure sort of with a long flowing white beard really sort of coming to represent ancient of days, but that's so insignificant to all that we can know about God. It's sort of this enduring ministry and we, we hear about God's amazing work. Today's first reading gives us the works of God. We see the effect of God in the life of the people of Israel saving them and bringing them out from bondage into the promised land and Moses is sort of giving this this elocution about how wonderful God is we don't actually see God at all in this first story but we're at least able to see the effects of God in our life we're able to see the sort of the tangible hand of God and sometimes represented in these beautiful mysterious ways pillars of fire or arms holding the sea back but none of those are in its totality God. God is still more than that. And who is Jesus? 
Well, this is the one we know the most about because Jesus tells us about himself. And in fact, what we know about God comes from what Jesus tells us. Thus, there's something profound to recognize that Jesus has to be more than just a really good person because Jesus gives us so much information that we would otherwise not have access to because of what Jesus reveals about God through himself. Jesus is sort of the most approachable, the most relatable, and yet even in his own way the most mysterious figure of the Holy Trinity, the sort of divine person who comes and gives everything, including his life, to save us who sometimes put Christ in that position. So perhaps the best way to understand the Trinity is what they do in their relationship, because each of them have a certain part, a certain role to play, though they're, they're not, you know, strictly speaking, sort of bound by that role. One of my favorite words is the word perichoresis, this divine dance of love, this self-giving dance of love. Now, that's a little bit different than the first time that Father Warren ever met me, in fact, because when he was the vocation director and I was on a vocation retreat, the first time that Father Warren ever met me wasn't, you know, I, he came up and said, hey, I'm Father Warren. He saw me flipping another person and teaching them a dance move. True story. But I've always loved dance because there's a place in dance, whether you're doing swing dance or whatever, my, my, my thing is swing dancing, that, that if you're especially doing sort of like a, a technical move, you know, and one of my favorites is called the candlestick. And you've probably seen it in all the movies because it's so, it's so spectacular, right? You do a side sit, a side sit, and then you split the difference and then, you know, toss the person up in the air and they're kind of kicking their feet. That can only happen when that balance is reached, right? If that person doesn't quite get up there, there's sudden, their whole weight is still in your arms. There's, there's suddenly this weight coming crashing down and usually injury results. Or if you put a little too much oomph, they go right over you and again, more injury results. The, the dance works when there is this sort of beautiful sort of symbiotic relationship. You know, if I'm throwing someone in the air, they're putting a lot of trust in me. But at the same time, they kind of have to be able to, to be aware of themselves and fully independent of me in order to be able to sort of make this happen. So I, I love this sense of dance, and even that is still short of this divine perichoresis, this holy self-giving love, this self-giving dance that is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, God, and the Son. And so I think in order for us to really enter into this, the way we go about it is by making space for what we know and what we don't know. Sometimes referred to this holy mystery. Because we can say things about God. For example, we can say that God is love. We can say that, you know, that God is present in the world. We can say that God is in Jesus and in the Holy Spirit. And what little we know of, as I said before, comes from Jesus. And so the truth is, if we understand how to live in this holy mystery, I think there are three things that this means for us today. The first, like that divine relationship, we're called to be dynamic and not static. You know, I'm paraphrasing C.S. Lewis who said that, you know, if you think about the words that God is love, it's another affirmation of this holy trinity. Because the act of love requires other persons. Right? This sheer sort of act of love to nothingness, well, you can't love what doesn't exist. Thus, that from the very beginning, Love was always an act between the divine, the divine trinity happening at all times. And it is through that love that all things are created. And thus, in that dynamic, ongoing, forever interaction, we're being invited to model that love for one another and for our world. In that same vein, we are called to be relational. The way that the Holy Spirit is in relationship, I keep saying Holy Spirit, I mean Holy Trinity. The way that the Holy Trinity is constantly in that divine relationship is that special sense in which we are called to recognize the divine in each and every person that we come in, in contact with. And this, my friends, is no small task because this means that there are people that we sometimes want to throw away, people with whom we disagree, people with whom we have sort of all kinds of issues with. We cannot simply dismiss them because within them, we believe that they are made in the image and likeness of God, and thus there is a reason to be in relationship with them. Now that's very complicated, and I don't mean to necessarily go into that, to that today, but I do want us to recognize that we are called to do the hard work of relationship. And finally, I think there is this invitation to rest in holy mystery. 
to let our minds sort of rest and relax in mystery. Now, this is totally antithetical to a lot of what we do. I mean, there are a lot of sort of procedural cop shows that, that love to hook us with mystery and our very desire is to want to watch until the very end so that we figure out what the mystery is, the who done it, what happened, and so on and so forth. So we're called to sort of go against that inclination, to rest in mystery, to allow it to be difficult, to, to allow it to rest, because if I sat here and read this a hundred times, I'm not sure that I would entirely understand this creed. They were going for specificity, not necessarily clarity. But I don't think it makes it untrue. I think it is this sort of divine thing that we can sit and ponder and allow our minds to continually unravel with. Even if that means that in this truest sense, we may never really truly understand it in this life, but we can hope for it in the life to come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.